Hi guys and welcome to episode 19 of our Race to Dakar 2020 series with Team Races to Places. Here I'm going to spend a little bit of time with my teammate Matt Sutherland exploring some of the differences between the Dakar Rally and the Africa Eco Race and the experiences I had on each event. I hope you enjoy it. Stop trying to look taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Tall TV. <laughs> We're on the tall guy. You're not taller than me, man. <laughs> so obviously for me, uh, doing the Africa Eco Race, this was my first big multi-day rally. Um, and a lot of questions I've had from, uh, from other people and a question that I have myself is, how do you compare the Africa Eco Race to the Dakar Rally? Um, and you can compare that in a number of different ways, but I think uh, first I'd like to start off with organisation. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, I've done three different Dakars, 2013, 2017, 2018, uh, and every rally that I've done, every Dakar rally that I've done has been different in so many ways. So yeah. they've all been in South America, um, but they've all been different in terms of level of difficulty, uh, and we'll come on to that. But in terms of organization, uh, the, the organization of the Africa Eco has far like, surpassed my expectations. Yeah. Um, I didn't expect the, the sort of service that we got from them. I mean, when our van broke down and they helped and they carted our van around, yeah. uh, it was amazing. Uh, you know, just so helpful towards the competitors and their goal is to get you to the end of the rally, which is everybody's goal at the race is to get to Dakar. So I really felt like the organization won everybody in that caravan, in that train that are at the race to get to the end. Uh, and that for me is really important because you spend a lot of money on these big races and you want to get to the finish line. Sometimes the Dakar rally is, is cruel because of this if you don't finish one stage, you're out of the rally. Yeah, and I know this year. I know you guys mentioned that when the when the van broke down. Obviously, um, the, the organisers were super willing to, like, within half an hour, they they were loading up the van, they were yeah. getting it to the boat. Like, they they weren't not gonna let us not get to Dakar. Yeah, no, they wanted to help and they're there to do it. And, and that happened numerous times throughout the series <coughs> and you can see that over and over. If we talk about the facilities and things at the rally, the bivouacs, I mean, um, the, the bivouacs are very, uh, the bivouacs are very locally featured, so like, you know, there's lo the locals put the tents up there uh, and the toilet and shower facilities and things, but that gives it the feel, the authenticness of Africa, you know? Uh, they, they're not posh facilities. <laughs> it's Africa, right? <laughs> it is, you know? Yes, at the Dakar Rally, sometimes the showers are hot, sometimes the showers are cold. At Africa Race, sometimes the showers that were hot, sometimes the showers were cold. I think uh, that adds a certain part to it as well. You're in the middle of the desert in Africa, Africa like um, you know you're gonna have to rough it at some point and, and you know when this race originally started that's what the guys were doing they were out there on their own yeah, exactly. roughing it for days on end so I found it actually quite good to be covered in dust and mm. exhausted and, and you know that, for me that was a that was a great part of it yeah and I think you know if anyone this this is not like um, you know, you don't go to these events to be pampered. You know, for me, it's not about that. It's about an adventure. It's about putting yourself through the ringer, you know? Yeah. It's a challenge, it's gotta be a challenge. And everything, you, for me, it was just, it was good. You know, I really enjoyed it. And I have to say the whole race as a whole, far like, you know, exceeded my expectations and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So what next? So, uh, another thing, difficulty, terrain, uh, the days, like distances, uh, liaisons, how do you compare Dakar and Africa Eco Race uh, yeah. with those type of things? Okay, so if I look at my Dakar 13, uh, I actually found it 
quite straightforward. It wasn't easy, but it was easier than anticipated, easier yeah. than expected. Uh, Dakar 17 and 18, completely the opposite. Really brutal, probably because I did Malimoto, it made it more difficult, um, but I think also the terrain, I mean, they'd really, from 13 to 17, they realized that they needed to get more technical. The riding needed to be more technical. The difficulty level needed to be higher and they really pushed it. And in Dakar 18, yeah. there was some really brutal stages there. Um, and I think a lot of people, including myself, expected the Africa race to be easier. Now, what I can say about the Africa race is the first week was all about getting down to Mauritania. So you've got really fast, high speed stages in um, in Morocco, which typically were faster than anything I've seen on any other valley uh, around the world that I've done. So it was very, very fast first week. Um, and But that, that also made it feel like it was in the olden <coughs> days. You know, we saw the 950s ripping through the desert at 130 miles an hour. Yeah. And it felt like the traditional race. And then we got to Mauritania and it was like, honestly, it was like a kick in the balls. <laughs> huh? it, was, it was completely technically challenging uh, what i would say is i think the africa race had a lot less uh, brutally technical riding like riverbeds and things like that yeah. like the dakar would put you through these riverbeds of rocks for like 60 kilometers and it was brutal you know your arms would be really you you got a lot less of that on the africa race but the varied terrain was there. There was still really technically challenging terrain. I think there was probably more difficult sand dunes in Mauritania than there was anywhere that I've had on the Dakar Rally. I mean, it was one minute you're riding along, the next minute you're swallowed up by a soft sand dune. Cartwheeling over the bars. Well, <laughs> all of us had a little bit of cartwheel anyway, <laughs> but I, I can honestly say I've never been over the handlebars as much as I did in the Africa race. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, for me, the technical level of the Africa race this year was right. You know, it yeah. was a good balance of riding. <clears throat> Even for the amateur, amateur rider could enjoy it, but there was some very challenging days and we saw that a lot of riders cut loose well, and took was, the road on that one day. There was one day where only, I think, 15 bikes, well, 17 including our boys, Joey and Greg. Yeah. Uh, I think 17 bikes only completed the entire special stage, so. Yeah. But, um, but that, and for those that didn't, I mean, Obviously we did, and for those that didn't, the ones that were just there to enjoy the experience and they were not really bothered about a result, um, they were able to cut, take the road and start the next day yeah. you know, and still finish the rally. And that, that for them is like really important. And I yeah. think that's why the Africa Rico race probably attracts more of a, um, an adventure rider seeking, you know, adventure seeking, adventure rider guy than a competitive racer. But what I would say, is at the front of the field, the top 10, like it was serious. It was a full on rally race, racing for positions. There was no, you know, this is not a serious race. It was serious at the front. You're on it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, <coughs> it was good. I really felt like it was a proper race uh, and um, yeah, difficulty level was good, well, terrain was good. Yeah, and you're battling it out with guys who are, you know, experienced and have really good results in Dakar in the past. So yeah. I, know, I know for me, coming to a race like this and then, you know, being able to beat those guys on time in some stages and be right up there, um, it's pretty cool because, you know, you always see see highlights and stuff on TV, yeah. but to get out there and, and be able to rub shoulders with the best. Yeah, no, it was, um, it was great. I really enjoyed it riding up there and uh, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Um, so lastly, lastly, I want to compare uh, the, what differences you found in having a team uh, compared to Mali Moto. Yeah, this, for me, this is one of the most important things to discuss and get over to people that followed both my Dakar series and the Africa Eco Race because uh, trying to explain to people the difference between Malimoto and riding with a team. Yeah. So for the last five years, I've 
travelled around the world on races to places on my rally bike. I've done an international cross-country race on every continent and I've done it solo. So Malimoto, looked after my own bike, done everything myself at each event. And I've had some good results. You know, I had second place in the Baja Rally, yep. fifth place in Sonora Rally, second place in the Kalahari Rally in South Africa and seventh in Rally Mongolia after all the troubles that I had there. Um, and I've, I've really had, and then the Dakar rallies that I did as part of Races to Places in Malimoto. But I have to say, having a good team behind me, like at this race, really was for me the reason that I rode so well. I never have ridden, I've never been able to ride in the last five years racing around the world like I rode at the Africa race. I rode how I know how to ride. Every morning, so I slept well for a start. <coughs> I got up every morning and my bike was perfect. I knew yep. it was right. I knew every change that I asked for had been done. And I knew I was going out on that day with a good night's sleep. I'd marked my road book well, because I wasn't rushing. Yeah. And I knew I had a team behind me to give me the best bike possible. And I went out there every single day and I rode how I know how to ride. And that, yep. that for me was the case in point that you know, people probably look and say, well, you know, why did you finish where you finished in Dakar, like in the 30s? Uh, and then at the Africa race, you finished higher. Well, obviously there's less competition here, yeah. but to be riding with the likes of Palanders, Ulval Seta, uh, Alessandro Bottori, uh, both, you know, one, Pal, Pal Matt Sutherland. <laughs> Matt Sutherland. <laughs> um, both <laughs> of those front running riders and a lot of the others, the Polish riders, yep. uh, some really fast, fast riders there. To be riding up with those guys who have had top 10 Dakar finishers, top top 10 Danak Dakar finishers back in the day, um, it was awesome. And I really felt like it was the team that helped me to do that. Yeah. So, and big and I guess for, for you know doing Mali Moto in the past, you have to be ride cautious because any damages you do to the bike, like what I did more often than not through the race, you have to fix yourself. So that's time off, off your sleep and, and that's, so, one thing that I, I talk about a lot in Malimoto and I have previously is, is the snowball effect. So you crashed your bike, I can't remember what stage it was, and yeah. completely trashed the navigation tower. You'd have literally been up all night repairing that. Yeah. Then you wouldn't have marked your road book, so you wouldn't have, and you wouldn't have got much sleep, so you wouldn't have rode as well the next day. That puts you back further in the field, which then makes it more difficult because <clears throat> there's more cars and trucks near you. Yeah. Then you put yourself at risk more, and then you get back to the bivouac late and the snowball effect just keeps going. Yeah. And then you get more tired, you have more accidents, you break more stuff. And it's like a big, you know, it's the snowball effect. Yeah. And it just gets worse. And in Malimoto, that's like, like it happens. As soon as one thing happens, it starts to get worse. Whereas with the team, you came in, you were still able to go mark your road book, eat your food and go to bed because exactly. the team fixed your bike back to 100% and you're out the next day. Yep. So having a team behind you, and I have to say the team that we put together, all the guys were there because they wanted to be there and they wanted to be part of team races to places. It made such a difference in the fact that everyone wanted to get all 12 people and all five bikes to the finish line at whatever cost. If they yep. had to stay up all night, like they were just, uh, they were just great. I can't speak highly enough for them. For me personally, that's what helped me to get a third place at the Africa race. Yeah, I think for me, you know, being an outsider and being able to come into a team like this, it was like walking into a family, you know, mm -hmm. and everyone's, as you said, everyone's willing to, to do what they got to do to, to get us to the finish line. And we got there, baby. Yeah. So. And to have us all, I mean, unfortunately, we're not all here. Uh, today in Switzerland, but uh, to have the majority of the team together, uh, it's, it's, it is like you say, a family. We've, we've just become really good buddies, friends for life. And I'm sure that as a- Compadres. As, yeah. I'm sure that as a, as a team, we will be getting ourselves together in the future again for something, because it, yeah. it was incredible. Well, hopefully these guys want to see more. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> we can bring it. Yeah, Don't we, you worry. Yeah, we, we've already got some ideas, uh, some ideas about future projects and all kinds of things. But uh, you know, these things—they don't come for free. Um, no. it's, it's a lot of effort and hard work on everybody's part um, to pull this off, and especially to share the project with the public. Uh, and I can't thank you enough all those people <coughs> that contributed to the Kickstarter campaign to allow us to share it for the media yeah. project, and also 
to the riders themselves because it's you know it's important that people know this watching the series all the riders paid for themselves to be at that race they paid for the support crew they paid for exactly. the entries there was no like huge factory sponsorship or anything like that all of my sponsors that were part of races to places contributed in some way towards the team and but the riders paid for themselves the costs of the race were split five between the five riders uh, and that's and, how we and did it so i think you know for all of us we're taking a month off work for for our own businesses and stuff yeah, too exactly. so you know it does affect a lot of things but i think you know to be able to come together and, and get it all done in the end with everyone's supporters pretty damn cool it's something we can look back on for life and yeah you know. i i didn't at the race itself i didn't see any episode after episode five i think it was because the ones in the beginning it was fine and then i just didn't have time to watch any episodes yeah. uh, but i sat and binge watched the whole series with camilla and earlier editing guys did a killer job and too. It, it was amazing uh, it blows me away how we managed to share the camaraderie, the fun, uh, the whole elements of being a team, nothing got hidden. We just shared everything as it was. And, and I think that for me is really special for the followers and everything to see exactly what it was like to race the Africa Eco Race with team races to places, a bunch of mates, 12 of us uh, pulling something that we all wanted bad you know, and making it right. Yeah, it was awesome. I think another thing to say too is like people look at the Africa eco race as you know sort of a lighter version of the Dakar rally but what they don't realize is the Africa eco race is the original Paris to Dakar mm. like it is no joke we are out mm. there busting yeah. our ass yeah. through hundreds of kilometers of kick-ass terrain yeah and the, and, the, and the resources if you think like at, at the Dakar rally they have multiple bivouac setups so maybe they have two bivouac setups that jump each other every yeah. day uh, that's another point actually the liaisons on the dakar uh, here the whole rally the service crews and the whole bivouac setup travels six seven hundred kilometers every day yeah like the races so while we're off racing the stage the whole bivouac is moving 700 kilometers at the same day. There's yep. no hopscotching of bivouacs. It's uh, it's it's a much more challenging, I think, for the service crews here yeah. at the Africa race and the organization. But it takes a really special individual, I guess, to put this authentic race on, which is the Dakar rally. Well, it's the race to Dakar. You yep, know? Exactly. And I think massive credit to John Louis Schlesser uh, and Rennie Metz yep. for having the vision of keeping this race, the traditional race from Europe to Dakar alive and making it like the success that it is today. It's growing every year and it's a proper race. And I, I, was, I was super happy with it and had, a, had an amazing time. And for me, it was challenging enough uh, and the experience was just amazing. So um, obviously I, I read Joey Evans' book and I've got a lot of friends who have raced Dakar and one thing everybody always says is the liaisons yeah. in Dakar are huge. So you know you might be up at 3.30am yeah. leaving in the dark and you might have to ride three, four hundred kilometres, yeah. race the special and then you've got to do it again yeah. after the special. Yeah, or you get up, you race the special, and then you've got a 700 kilometer liaison yeah. after the special. Like that, yeah, that's a good point. That the Af whereas yeah. in the Africa Eco yeah. race, it was like travel a kilometer yeah. and then five, you yeah. know, so, four to 600 kilometers of just uh, of off road racing. Yeah, so at the Africa race, uh, one thing that was big difference from the Dakar rallies that I've done all of them is that there was no getting up at 3.30 in the morning and riding in the dark on a liaison to get to the state at start, start of the stage. Pretty much, not always, because obviously there's some liaisons occasionally, but pretty much every stage, uh, the majority of the stages started from the bivouac or within a few kilometers of the bivouac. I guess it adds a lot of, uh, lot of safety too yeah. to the and, rally. And then you race a huge loop and then you finish a few kilometers from the bivouac and you've traveled 700 kilometers away 
while you've done your stage and the service crews have also traveled 700 kilometers to the new bivouac um, so from a riding point of view we were getting up at a respectable time um, going and starting the day in the daylight and for most of us finishing in the daylight <laughs> but uh, yeah it was it was different in that respect because the liaisons were cut down and i think that has a lot of effect on the riders from a, a tiredness point of view because um, you know you're not sat on the liaison for four hours in the dark in the morning or yeah. a long liaison after the stage that the liaisons were cut to a minimum and I think that's a really good thing like you say from a safety point of view um, and also from a race we come to ride rally and do stages exactly. not to sit on the road on for 500 kilometers on liaisons yeah and i think for me um you know i'm i'm gonna take on the dakar in, in the future here and it's and that's sort of the one thing that i'm not looking forward to is long liaisons i, I haven't got the experience in these big rallies but you know when, when you imagine racing motorbikes from europe all the way through africa to dakar you know you think it's going to be this rugged just tough crazy event that's exactly what it was <laughs> it is yeah. it was freaking wild man and you know what i'd do it all again in a second <laughs> <Poo>. <laughs> I'm